Hello, Legionnaires, and welcome to some Rando RPG livestream. Tonight, our panel of Dungeon Masters, Game Masters, Referees, Storytellers, and Players will share their diverse tabletop role-playing game experiences to provide ideas, suggestions, and possibly even some advice for your tabletop RPG sessions. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to some Rando RPG livestream. I am John Max Liauschlo, your host, and I am truly grateful that you are with us for tonight's live stream on TSR versus Watsi Dungeons and Dragons. And I sincerely hope you enjoy this conversation. So, what do we do here in some Rando RPG live stream? Well, in segments one through four, we discuss topics surrounding the tabletop RPG hobby with an emphasis on individual experiences desires, and expectations. In tonight's four segments on TSR versus Watsi Dungeons & Dragons, we hope to provide you ideas, suggestions, and food for thought for your tabletop RPG sessions. And then in segment five, we let down our hair, just talk about nerd issues of interest. If we meet the giveaway threshold, it's segment five is when we will have that. Please consider supporting Legion of Myth through the links in the live stream's description. YouTube takes 30%, Twitch takes 50% of your hard-earned money, while Rumble, PayPal, Streamlabs, and Ko-Fi take around 0 to 5% of your donation. As always, Rumble rants and Super Chats less than $20. I will read at the end of the segment. $20 or more, I will interrupt the segment to read your rant or chat as immediately as I can. And $50 or more, which I should probably have a shot glass ready because people have been doing this recently. I will take a drink in your name and you can force the panel to answer any tabletop RPG related question of your choice right then and there. Of course, if we make $100 or more in Super Chats or Rumble Rants, there will be a 20, no, a $50, that's right, because nobody won it last week, $50 Palladium Books or drive through RPG gift card giveaway during segment five. Legion of Myths YouTube members as well as tonight's Super Chatters and Rumble Ranters will have the opportunity to win, but you must be watching at the time of the giveaway to claim your victory, else it rolls over to the next week. Don't forget that Legion of Myth moderators will time out or even ban people who attack any panelist or chatter. Attack the argument, not the person, and keep your various social media beefs off of my show. I know, that's so weird for people who are watching maybe a year ago, but deal with it, that's the way it is now. Please like this video and subscribe to all the panelists' channels found in the description, and thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and support. Now, with that out of the way, let's get started. Who do we have with us tonight? Well, looking over here, we have Bear the Gen X GM. Sir, who are you? What content or products do you create, and what is your tabletop RPG experience? I've done this so many times, I never know what to say. Hi, I'm Bear. I have a channel. I produce my own gaming material. I publish some stuff. I did some comics, worked in the film industry. Now I'm here. I don't know why. Find my link right there at Bear the Gen X GM. Head on over. Subscribe if you want. And what is my pedigree of role playing? Uh, I've been doing it since 85. That's all I got. Okay. Below him. I probably shouldn't say it that way. Anyway, really sure. no. <laughs> we have a uh, brand new to the show. We have Harmony Ginger. So same question for you. Who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? I'm Harmony Ginger at gingerblast on Twitter and uh, Harmony underscore Ginger on YouTube. I don't really sell anything. I'm mostly just a hobbyist. I just like to talk about games. Sweet. Really all I talk about. So that's it. <laughs> well, when did you start playing uh, role playing games? Oh, um, I've been playing on and off for most uh, since, since I was old enough to be allowed to. I wasn't allowed to as a kid, so <laughs> I know yeah. what that's like. Satanic or, panic so was real people. Depending on how old you think I am, maybe quite a long time. All right, fair enough. And then Malachi, who are you? What contents or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? My name's Malachi. I got a blog. He's got the link in the description. Been in this game since early 90s. Malachi sounds so excited to be here yet again. I'm stuck with Max. <laughs> All right. I just realized I forgot to turn my ceiling fan on, so I'm going to start cooking here in a moment. But anyway, we got to get started. So tonight's topic is on TSR D&D versus WotC D&D. Now, this might surprise a... Can, yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, this might surprise a couple of folks out there. Anybody who's watched this channel knows my thoughts about TSR versus WotC D&D. WotC isn't Dungeons & Dragons. You will never convince me that it is. They own the IP. Everything else is crap. It's not D&D. That's not why we're here. Here we actually want to do a comparison of, in terms of 
uh, how it started, the gameplay mechanics, the modules, and then, you know, how it affects the community and community growth with it, yada, yada. So we are not here. I mean, I don't care if they do diss on either one of them, but we're not here for that purpose. If you came here looking for, oh, they're going to crap all over. No, oh, that's not the intent. If it happens, it happens, though. So. Our first segment today is on the historical context and evolution of the game. And we're going to start with Bear. And so, Bear, first question for you is, what were the major innovations introduced by TSR in the early editions of Dungeons & Dragons? This is almost a gimme question with that. And how did they shape the game for the future? Well, the, the, the big... The, so it's a, it's a good question, uh, but the issue is going to be this. What is the major innovation? Uh, Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Uh, um, the introduction of polyhedral dice to all the humans of the world. I mean, it's a really, really, really base question. But what we can say is from the first edition to second edition, there was always innovation all the way along. Every edition, every version from the Beckme to the BX to the 1E to the 2E to the Up on the Mountain. It was something new but familiar and just added more options, more choices, or in the case of Beckme, streamlined those choices into a more cogent sort of line. So I would say for me, that's that's kind of what you mean. Like, it's a weird question. I thought about it all week, and I was like, I got nothing. I, I know. It, it, I mean, it's because you kind of gave the answer. like, what was innovative about the first game ever? Yes. It created the hobby. Yeah, essentially, yes. I mean, to be fair, the Malachi, hobby did exist before it. But... Jeez, Malachi. Jeez, Malachi. <laughs> So I, I'm I'm gonna follow you up as as a, as a game designer bear, somebody who's writing yeah. his own game. What do or you think fun. were the strengths of TSR's approach to game design, and so, how did that manifest during gameplay? Okay, so TSR's approach to game design is why I refer to D and D as baby's first role playing game. Okay, <laughs> no, it's true, and I do, and I, I used to try and apologize for it, but now I don't care. Now I'm just gonna say it: it's baby's first role playing game, and like McDonald's, it's a flavor. And maybe about twice a year, I get that craving where I really, really, really want that quarter pounder with cheese and bacon. And then after I'm done, I'm like, oh, God, why <laughs> yeah. did I do that to myself? Well, well, that's oh how my God. Is for me. A couple of times a year, I'll get that, I should really run a D&D campaign. And then I do. And about halfway through it, I'm like, oh, God, why did I do this? Because it gave us such structure and 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 pigeonholing and boundaries and an end zone and everything else we would want. But I felt that stifled creativity in a lot of ways, which is why we see the same arguments all the time happening over D and D. Uh, there is a better way. There are different ways. There are varied games that would never exist without D and D. So I must always tip my hat to the grandmaster and say thank you. But we've evolved beyond you, and it's clear when you look at what Watsi's been doing. The evolution is leaving them behind, and sadly. I can't say D&D is innovative anymore, but once upon a time it was, and it laid the groundwork for us. It gave us the idea of classes. It gave us the idea of the, the, the dopamine chasing level. It gave us the idea of the plus four Holy Avenger and everything else that we carry as tropes to this day. Mm -hmm. But it's long in the tooth old and maybe it needs to be taken up behind the shed. I'm just <laughs> old yeller, that thing. All right. All right. Let's uh, move on down to Harmony Ginger here. We're going to ask you the same question. What were the major innovations introduced by TSR in the early editions of D&D and how did they shape the game for the future? So first, let me start by saying my experiences with the early editions of D&D are rather limited. I have played ad and I've never actually played od and though I have read the original uh, white, bo uh, white box. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> But um, I, I, I think that that's kind of a strange question because uh, they were originally rules to put like wizards, magic users into chain mail. And so it's kind of, um, it kind of evolved, I think, from there into something of what we know today. So really, I mean, the innovations are the advent of role playing games, uh, more or less, uh, which came from the original D&D and um, eventually Tunnels and Trolls, which was kind of a, um, which was somewhat similar with just wild combat. I've been looking into that one recently. But um, anyway, it, I would say that TSR was kind of the advent of a lot of D&D, &D. not necessarily as we know it today, but it's, it's definitely where the hobby came from. Um, I don't know what you mean by specific innovations that they brought to it, though, because it's like most of it. 
If, uh, you know, and and that is that is fair. Um, I I, I, I guess just... the, the the question, I guess, from my mm -hmm. point of view on this one is, what is a standout feature of of a we'll say original D and D? And I don't mean OD and D specifically now, but any of the TSR versions of D and D. A standout feature that just makes you say, you know what, this was awesome. It was a great idea, whether it's implemented by Watsi or not. Uh, this kind of transcends the game itself, and, and it's just something that identifies something as D and D. Um, I, w I would say then the microcosm of um, of war games where you're focused on one character or a group of characters and um, the rolling for stats, the uh, the journey from almost nothing into owning a stronghold, a city, um, a, a wizard's tower, wherever you end up. Basically, I, I would say the character progression, the journey is a um, is a major in innovation there the whole zero to hero concept i mean that, not the whole concept obviously that's a literary concept as sure. old as time but uh gamifying it i would say okay sounds good all right malachi you know how we do it here but i'm still going to ask it to you for the sake of the audience what were the major innovations introduced by tsr in the early editions of DD, and how did they shape the game for the future well, i mean a lot of it is there D, D was really, the, I think, the formation of the hobby, getting it out there to the masses. Because up until then, it was just these couple small pocket areas around the country. Now, I think that was the biggest thing. And innovation-wise, I mean, oh, just uh, like the level progression. Just when you. XP and leveling, you look at how that has transcended to other media, like Final Fantasy. You take a look at the very first Final Fantasy, and everything is very similar to OD&D. You have your fighter class, you have your white mage, your cleric, who doesn't get a level, a spell at first level in the game. They have to wait till second level, just like in OD&D and in basic. Your black mage is your wizard. You know, a lot of their tropes that they had with the classes went it over to the video game area okay uh would you so actually i know this would be good for you so can you describe a specific edition or supplement released by tsr that significantly influenced your gameplay to this day and how did it do so i'm gonna have to say the for the basic line the um creature crucible series Okay. When they first came out, I only had the Night Howlers, which was playing were creatures. And it was just it just it opened up the game for me. Like you had this basic game where you know you have your rule cyclopedia, which is how I started. And you can play an elf, a dwarf, a human, a halfling, and that was really it. But then you get these creature crucible lines like, here's a were creature. Whoa. Two different XP tracks. And everything, general skills for your wear creature specifically, that was really cool. That was something I really wish I had a chance to really delve into. And then also, you know, the expansion of Mistara, the setting you get uh, because of the werewolves and their ties to French culture, you get a lot of that getting added to Mistara. Okay, I'm going to open up one more follow-up to all of you, and then you guys can uh, cross-talk with each other and you know do any follow-ups that you have there. Is, uh, how did RPGA and things like Dragon Magazine help to grow TSR, or TSR's D&D specifically, and keep players interested in Dungeons & Dragons for literally decades? And this is open to anybody, so oh, anybody can uh chime in. I never had RPGA. It was not. A, I, I think we were something about Canadian. You couldn't subscribe or something at the time because it was the Aww. 80s. It was weird. Oh, it's okay. I didn't miss it. Um, <laughs> but um, Dragon, I used to buy Dragon Magazine all the time uh, without fail. I, I love Dragon Magazine. It was a great read. Phil and Dixie, What's New was my probably my favorite comic panel script ever. Like it was just. So well, what, good. what did the, what did Dragon Magazine then do to keep you interested? Give me stuff to read about D and D, about things. It let me look at ads for games. I'd never. What, what is mm -hmm. a petal or throne of Tecumel? What is that? You know, that's what it was. It was great fun, and it was like looking into another world outside of my limited one. And then, uh, then my one got bigger, and suddenly 
Dragon Magazine wasn't needed anymore. But at the time in the 80s, Dragon Magazine, Challenge Magazine, all those house engines really kept me going when there was no material for me to buy off the shelf otherwise. Yeah, and to be fair, I mean, you can include Polyhedron, you can include Dungeon, et cetera. I mean, what, whatever your magazine of choice was, you know, for that. Yeah. Uh, Dungeon go ahead, Malachi. was great for your adventures. Dragon gave you DMs material, gave players material. I know there's a one issue during the one year that had a scout class. You know, you could get new classes. I think there was a lot to keep your imagination going, you know, to help your world building available. And then the ads, you know, you see the ads, like there's this black and white ad for this game where they have giant stumpy robots and monsters. It's called <laughs> Riffs. This looks awesome. Man, man, it's funny you say stuff. that because uh, the, my first Dragon Magazine ever was uh, because it had Battletech rules in it. <laughs> and that was another thing that they were very good about, especially... Early on, they covered other games uh, outside of uh, TSR. I think it was actually when the rain took over that they started just focusing on TSR. Okay. All right. Uh, anything you guys have for each other at this point? The floor is open to you all with regard to that first question or follow-up. Anything you want to add to it while I make a cat happy? I uh, didn't really exist in the 80s, but... Um, <laughs> you youngins! I No, but I definitely understand, and I, I think that uh, the magazines were probably a big deal back before, you know, the internet existed, because I was never allowed to play D&D before high-speed internet was pretty standard. So, I mean, if I ever needed to look up anything or look up Dungeon Master ideas, I always had the internet to help me do that. Um, however... Before that, I can see how um, how important the magazines were for the culture, certainly. I mean, it was still there up to the third edition. Yeah, I um, yeah, I think 2008 was when I started playing for the first time, but I never subscribed to the magazines. I know there were later oh. ones. Uh, they, they're free on archive.org, though, and I've uh, yeah. been reading some select issues. So, <laughs> Well, I feel old. <laughs> All right, me too. I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, my back's gone out. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Got that pacemaker going. Uh, as far as somebody who did the RPGA thing on occasion, uh, I, I wasn't like fully vested with it, but uh, like, so. When I was at my first duty station in Albuquerque in the early '90s, there they did a lot of RPGA events uh, there uh, at War Games West, but. I didn't really get into that stuff because I kind of thought that they were, this is before I really understood what LARPing was, but I thought that they were the drama kids and, you know, LARPing, you know, for points, like what, what is going on here? But when I did do it and I was just, I played the way I play. Uh, and if you've watched Bears, uh, a Codex Albana game, you'll see how I play. I had fun. I did have fun with it. I just didn't want to join like, the D&D club, if that makes sense. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but this is the same thing. Like, I played with my friends, and we played various games. We played D&D, and we played Star Trek, and we played Marvel. But I had no interest in making this a lifestyle or becoming, you know, a joiner. Sign up, a Merry Marvel Marching Society member. I, no, no, thanks, I'm good. In fact, most of the people I met who were like that at the time, in the 80s, it was a different world, Harmony. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. Wow. No, but deodorant was like a, a sacred relic that they would have to go on a quest to find and then <laughs> oh, figure out how to do. Very, very bad. true. Um, so I didn't really do a lot of the, the public stuff. I didn't do a lot of the, the larger world stuff. Plus in Canada, we didn't have a lot, especially in Quebec, French Canada, we didn't have a lot of that stuff. Uh, so, you know, c'est la vie, but sadly it is what it is. Okay, well, thank you for doing my I, TED talk. I think, I think we beat this first question uh, uh, down enough here. So let's read some super chats, and then we'll move on to the second question. Um, first of all, oh, that Baird, you did that like last week, and it still got you on here. What the hell? <laughs> I just clicked the buttons. Rigs. That was all I'm good for. Rig. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, you're gonna get your shout out here. You're just not gonna win the contest. <laughs> There you go. Uh, Gunther the Mad, thank you very much for gifting five Legion of Myth memberships. If you received a membership from Gunther, you have access to a whole ton, thousands, literally thousands of videos that are members only that I have uh, long since moved there because their relevance is just not as eh, anymore. 
Gunther the Mad also for ten dollars says question for the panelists. Hmm. Can I make you answer this question since it didn't meet the threshold? Well, it's up to you guys. I'll let you. You can volunteer to answer if you want. Uh, question for the panelists: What was the best product TSR put out, and why was it Dragonlance Adventures? And he's talking about the first edition hardcover Dragonlance Adventures, which. Oh wait, I have my one e books up there. I had that. Do you think on Earth Arcana was the best? OMG. Are you kidding me? The Cavalier was the greatest class ever invented. It wasn't broken class ever. <laughs> it was not broken. It was awesome, and it kicked much at, uh, butt. It kicked all the butt. It kicked every <laughs> ounce of butt. Yes, it did. If there was a butt in the room, the Cavalier was kicking it. In both attitude and in capability. <laughs> this well, is true. It was true. nice to see the French getting a you know, recognition in D&D. &D. It, it was very uh, The Chevalier. Chevalier, excuse me. <laughs> Cavalier, what chevalier? Cavalier. Yeah, whatever. Go back uh, to France, limey. Oh wait. <laughs> anyway, let's. I am going to say it's actually the what is it? Oh, the book for Taladis, the box set for Taladis for Dragon. That was Dice. second edition. That's two e. Yeah, but you said TSR. Well, yeah, that's true. That is true. It says TSR product. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought it was one e. Oh, then I'm going to say the Complete Fighter's Handbook. Okay, we can't be friends anymore. The complete uh, cleric <laughs> Almost everything in that book, I think, is trash. But see, that's what's awesome about uh, the second edition is that it has so much splat that people complain about. But we picked and chose what we wanted to use. If at Bear's table you used it, at my table you didn't, people say, okay, and move on. Instead of like, no, I demand you use the splat that was put out. All right, Grandpa. I know, we'll right? Dinner soon. <laughs> and then I we have. Oh, oh, by the way, uh, and Har actually, Harmony, if you want to jump in on that one for TSR, yeah, I'm, I, I apologize. I all right. Well, um, first of all, I'm the type of person whose favorite book is usually the last one I've read. Um, so I've been reading a bunch of Ravenloft stuff from um, from what I believe it's AD&D right now. And I, I really like the Ravenloft stuff. There, there's some yes! crazy stuff yes, in there. Yes, yes. And oh. but, but I'm not I'm not going to say that's my favorite because the one book by TSR and this is such the most generic answer I could give. But the one oh. book I always go back to for my encounters is AD&D &D DMG. That I know. is a very good DMG. <laughs> It's so good for random encounters. It has a, they have like sub tables for everything. They have it split up for like different areas. It's actually really intuitive, very well laid out. And I mean, the random dungeon generation and that is good too. Like I really like their tables and I don't even run AD&D. I just, I use it. Mm -hmm. I, I was using the AD&D DMG to roll up encounters for Shadow Dark last week. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot of people there were doing it, and, and I apologize for not caught. I, I had it stuck in my head. Oh, she doesn't play TSR D and D. Don't waste her time or put her on the spot. And my mistake. I apologize <laughs> for that. <laughs> yeah, like I said this before. You two can e put me on the spot. Two E <laughs> Player's Handbook, Two E Monster Manual, One E DMG. Okay, That's sir, sir. Monsters Compendium, please. Monsters Compendium. Thank you. Wait, uh, I had the sir, book. Sir, I don't have the binder. Monstrous Manual. Please. Yeah. No, the monster right. manual is garbage compared to the compendiums. No. With this nice no. loose leaf, you could pull it out. No. You could do what you want. No. Wrong, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> but I, another TSR product I really like. It's the one von Richten's guide. It's the one with the were creatures. Oh, all of yes. von Richten guides were There's awesome. A lot of those. Mm -hmm. The chart about all the different races and catching like entropy from different animals. Mm -hmm. So cool. I, I like all the Von Richten's guides for second edition. I love the different uh, age levels of the vampires. I love the different ghosts. I mean, ghosts are scarier than hell in, in Ravenloft now. Oh, it can age you for uh, 10 to 40 years. Oh, we can do so much more, mister. Uh, you know, the whole idea that vampires can suck out eye juice or spinal fluid instead of just blood. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in, in the Ravenloft. I, my, but, I'm going to drop one more quick before we move on. Uh, you said your favorite, not all of the books that you ever read. Jesus. Seriously, Malachi. <laughs> Seriously. No, I just remember the house is okay. This is why, 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 this is why this you, you play, Malachi. Why is <laughs> this is why the segment's an hour long. <laughs> Go ahead, Malachi. Finish up. <laughs> this is the House of Strahd. I think that's the best version of the Ravenloft module. Wait? You mean the 5E? Yeah, house, no, House of Strahd is 2E. They What's updated it? the module. They updated, changed some mm -hmm. of the monsters around it for more gothic encounters. And there's like two or three different versions of Strahd in it. 
Okay. I, I, I might not have got that one because I have the original Ravenloft, so I might not know I about that one. Okay. I got that as a POD instead of Ravenloft. Because I was reading about it, like, wow, this is so freaking cool. Okay. Well, while Dragonlance Adventures First Edition is one of my all-time favorite books, it is, to me, the best version of Dragonlance put out by TSR. My favorite book that TSR put out was actually the Manual of the Plains. And it is the reason, one of the reasons why I hate Planescape so much. Manual of the Plains was, you know, when we talk Palladium books a lot, it was such a perfect framework. It set the tone, but then you went off on your own from there. So Bear's uh, 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 Nirvana would be different than my Nirvana, but would have similarities. Harmony's, uh, uh, um, I forget the names of all the planes, uh, Happy Hunting Grounds would be similar because there was already a framework in there, but different than Malachi's Happy Hunting Grounds. So, like, I, and I love books that do that. And also, The Blood War is cool, and Sigil is the most retarded thing that D&D's ever done in its existence. And that's why it went out of business. Don't hold back, Max. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> well, we're going to move on to the next one. Thank, by the way, Gunther, thank you for the $10. Law Dog for $10 says, One of the biggest innovations of D&D was creating a system that allowed people to step into the books and stories that they love to play. Uh, a personal part in telling of those stories. I think I missed a comment in there somewhere. But, yes. Uh, one of the things that I will talk about, and if these uh, fine folks here want to disagree with me, they can. You know, we got some people on, on YouTube channels that say it's just a game. It's nothing more than a game. Treat it like a game. If you're doing more in Monopoly, you're wrong. We have other people that say you need to, you know, you treat it like it's a freaking movie, an actor, and you have a director going, you know, at the end of a scene. I'm kind of in the middle of that where I like it like a book. I want to I want to see my character in the trilogy, but I want the exposition. I want the game master's narration. I want the scene set before me, and I want to be able to react to it as a character. But I also remember it's a game. I actually love rolling dice. I love looking up things on charts. Not looking up every rule. I'm just talking like, oh, I don't know. Did this kill them? Let's find out. And looking it up because there's a game aspect as well. And I think that this is the role-playing games are the hybrid between LARPing and acting, whatever term you want to put here, and and just sitting down and playing shoots and ladders with your friends. It, it fits that nice little happy hunting grounds, happy medium there uh, between. I'm a self-confessed uh, dirty, filthy story gamer, so I have no opinion on this. <laughs> I like okay. I, I am kind of in between as well. I, I think it's about like a living world and I mean, you follow the players for a while, but if they die, they die. I mean, it's about the world and the players' effect on it. Absolutely. So, I don't know what that makes me. Slightly dirty, filthy story gamer. Welcome. To oh the yeah, club. okay. It's a great place to be, by the way. <laughs> we tend not to argue, but encumbrance very much. <laughs> <laughs> Malachi. Nope. Oh, well, I thought you were going to say something. Okay. Thank no, you for the super chat. Kind of lean on that side, story gamer side. You know, you know how I feel. It's emergent storytelling. It's like I don't want the game master to come in with his story that somehow I'm a pawn in. But at the same time, like Harmony said, have that world that that feels lived in, or feel there, or I feel like I exist there, not just a pawn on a hex board. At the same time, even though I love hex crawls, you know, I think there's a good balance there. And oh, we just got another super chat in. Walter MC says official notice. It is not permitted to notice this notice. What? Floor. Okay, well, thank you for being a member for 10 months now. I will decipher that code later. Get your Enigma machines out. <laughs> An Agile Monk says, I'm continuing to grow in my love for this channel. Uh-oh, sorry to hear that. An excellent panel tonight. And shout out. Wait, wait. Oh, and a shout of love out to Bear. Like, that's unusual. We never get that. Hold on. No, Stop the presses. The <laughs> what, are you, what have you done with Agile Monk. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yes, I am. The channel, I, I, it is where I want it right now. I'm enjoying the panels that we're having. We have great guests on. Every now and again, we get a new one on, like Harmony Ginger, and I really appreciate that. So uh, all we can do here is grow and get better. So, uh, you know, sometimes we have to remove people like, uh, but I mean, you know, just say, <laughs> but I uh, appreciate that. And thank you for that 999. Well, I think we're ready to move into the second, uh, second question now, as soon as I get this back up here. Okay, well, we'll start the second question with Harmony Ginger. In terms of design, concept, and business practices, not game mechanics. So uh, I realized later that I should have clarified this question better. So let me give a little exposition here. 
we're talking about overall game design, not specifically, you know, what is the plus one, what is the plus two? For example, in D&D, you have a lot of subsystems, right? Thieves, depending on what edition you're playing, but thieves might roll percentile dice, or wizards have their own little you know, spell mechanics going on, yada, yada, yada. That's what we mean by design, just the overall mechanics. Uh, so in terms of design concept and business practices, what were the major innovations introduced by WotC in the later editions of Dungeons & Dragons, and how did those change the game? Okay, so this one I can answer better. I believe that the major design innovations, if you can call it that, because this is a bit of a regression, I believe, is um, the making everything the same. Things no longer, like classes no longer advanced on different level rates. Um, there, classes all seem to feel like they play the same. Like you don't have a separate, um, you, you don't have like separate uh, mechanics for different classes so much like there's no um like psionics use something not way out different that you only have to learn if you have psionics that's not like a thing anymore but basically they homogenize a lot uh, in terms of design i think that's like kind of the major overview i would say is there's a lot of homogenization but um in terms of business practices i think the ogl is uh probably the best thing what c uh introduced to the um introduced to D&D. I, I, I don't think know if we're going to talk about it later, but that was certainly a game changer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe it or not, like, um, oh man, I don't want to stand for WotC here, but um, okay, it, like really I don't, but uh, I mean, the OGL was just, yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm just going to leave it with that. I'm not going to talk about how much TSR was suing everyone. We're not going to do that. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and again, this is this follow up might seem like the original question, but uh, let's see if we can uh, nail something more down here. Uh, how did the release of third edition by Watsi revolutionize the game compared to second edition? Because you know, second edition was going through problems, but there are a lot of people love it or hate it because it didn't have Gygax's name on it. It was still through all the editions of TSR, they're fairly compatible and fairly understandable and fairly recognizable. Then third edition comes out and revolutionizes it. So, how do you think? Other than the obvious, it's different rule set. Just in terms of players, how did that revolutionize the game and maybe even the hobby? Are you asking me? Y yes. Oh, I was, asking, I was okay. asking follow up to I'm my sorry. <laughs> I thought it was someone else. Okay. So um, in terms of third edition, I think the um, I think they changed the focus is a big thing. They changed the focus of uh, so in like uh, first edition and AD and D, I believe a lot of the rules and the focus were on the world and on the characters impact on the world. And you didn't have like really in-depth character builds, but I believe third edition was more influenced by magic, the gathering where uh, people were building their own decks. And so they took kind of some of the influence of magic, the gathering and put them into a, put it into D and D where you're building your character, like you would a deck in magic, the gathering uh, where you're customizing it rather than like rolling a dice when you make your character and you have like, I don't know, a 1% chance of starting off with this. And like when somebody else, when somebody gets one of those like rare things like psionics or something, that's like a big deal. But that, that was, you would build towards that starting in third edition. There wasn't like a whole lot of randomization and character generation, except for your stats, which I, I don't actually remember if the third edition uh, D and, uh, DMG or Player's Handbook had um, forced you to do it one way. I think it was a uh, 46 drop one, which made you a little bit stronger than originally. But the big, uh, the, the big change, I think, is more focus on characters and character builds and less focus on the character's impact on the world specifically. And um, more like less influence less emphasis on controlling like an army or retainers or things like that. And more on just that one character. Yeah. I, I called it uh third edition Lego characters. Cause especially yeah. when you got prestige classes, you just start mixing and matching the Legos and, you know, end up with the shape that you hopefully wanted in the end. All yeah, right. Definitely. Uh, Malachi, over to you in terms of design. You understand what I'm saying, what I uh, mean when I say design now, right? That explanation was good. Okay, so in terms of design concept and business practices, not game mechanics, what were the major innovations introduced by WotC in later editions of D&D, and how did they change the game? Uh, of course, you, gotta, you have to mention the OGL. I think that was the biggest thing that WotC did during their so far during their time. And in a way, it's also one of the 
worse things to happen to the hobby too because a lot of people latched onto that and next thing you know they're done for alderac is a perfect example they latched onto that every book was every smc book was dual statted every l5r book legend of the five rings book was dual statted and where are they now chaosium has 7c and fantasy flight has legend of the five rings alderac is a board game company now um and you know the third edition i brought about this overly customizable system rule set to the game i think was at the time it was great it seemed neat but looking back was it i don't think it was really that necessary and the magic the gathering analogy i think it was a great one you were building a character like a deck and there i know like i think there are traps that you can go into in magic when you build a deck you can do that making your character and then from what i've read they did that on purpose no it wouldn't surprise me uh, how did watsi's acquisition of dungeons and dragons change the production quality and presentation of game materials oh oh man you those third edition books especially the hard covers when you look at that background that was tough on the eyes uh, I know, like first editions, breeze to read. Yeah, granted, the the print might be kind of small. <laughs> say, but, zero point font, but <laughs> and in high but Gagaxian. It, but it's black on white, easy to read. Fair. In general, second edition is fairly easy on the eyes, very easy to read. But you get to some of the what Watsi's done is you've got to be all in color. You got to have that background. No, you don't. That is just too much, and it it drains your eyes, it drains your brain, and just. It makes it a chore to read. I can right. honestly, I think 1E is a lot easier to read than 3rd edition. Okay. Krantz is saying everything that I, I don't even have to say anything anymore. Krantz is saying it all in chat for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, all right, let's move over to Bear. Same question I for you, sir. In, t in terms of design concept and business practices, not game mechanics, what were the major innovations introduced by WotC in the later editions of D&D, &D, and how did they change the game? So we'll move away from the OGL since the other two handled it adeptly and adroitly. Um, I would say probably it was making it accessible to the masses, drawing in a fan base that had not been playing for a long time. And that was what third edition did. It brought a lot of people who played D&D in college 10 years before, five years before, who were no longer playing D&D. They found out there was a new edition of D&D and they were like, what? And they flooded in and blew it up. And it was big. People like to think 5e is a big deal. Eh, take out the pandemic, 5e can't hold a torch to what three, third edition was and how that just revolutionized and brought role-playing back. To, I mean, they saved role-playing. Let's just be honest. The gaming stores suddenly were putting product on the shelves again. And then the D20 glut that happened did start as D20 product on shelves that was selling. There was a good boom in the market. Yes, there was a bust. Absolutely. It was just like the dot-com bubble. There was the third edition or the D20 bubble, whatever you want to call it. But it did bring a lot of people back, and as a result, it revived, saved, and continued D&D. Because people tend to forget how dead D&D was before Watsy bought them. Mm -hmm. It was dead. It was doornail dead. Vampire was the beast. Everyone was playing Vampire. Vampire had taken their lunch money at that point in time. Now... Well, they revived it. They got it back. They almost lost it again with fourth, but man, they really did uh, revive the uh, the D and D world and the brand. Did a good job of it. I didn't like it, but that's me, you know. But I can't deny their success. I promise I won't go down this rabbit hole. But I, I it's just I can't. If I don't say it, I'm going to explode. Just say it. That that whole idea that you said that it's for the masses is true. It's that change from. The hobby, and you can go back to any of <laughs> hundreds of previous live streams to hear me rant about this. But it's the the difference between the hobby being hobbyists or a business, and I think that businesses ruin all hobbies. You cannot name a single one from fishing to football to model airplanes that a business oriented mindset doesn't ruin. I just think it's the nature of it. And Watsi was certainly the business side of it. Successful, yes. <sighs> 
good for the hobby, debatable because what matters more, quality, potentially non-existence, or quantity, and as, as Harmony said before, all the homogenization and so forth. I'll leave that to the viewer or to watch some other live streams of mine. But, Bear, your follow-up is going to be, uh, how did the transition from TSR to Wizards of the Coast impact the overall direction and design of not only Dungeons & Dragons, but games as a whole? Uh, it made them commercial in a way they hadn't been before. That's for sure. Uh, it would the, the worst, as we already mentioned, was the D20 everything. Mm -hmm. I love Farscape. Farscape is one of those sci-fi franchises that I have a deep, deep, passionate love for. And I, I, I know you hate it. Shut up. Um, <laughs> we, we've been over this road. We don't need to go down this track again, my friend. I just that, sighed. That's all I did was sigh. <laughs> whatever, whatever. Earth Dawn D20. That's what you're oh, oh, Wow. Um, so... Farscape is something I would love a role-playing game of. Oh, wait, there was one. Oh, crap, it was D20. Never mind. And that was the problem. Everything was D20, and I think that was the change that happened, was they created the mentality of the singular system that everybody started publishing for because they believed that's where the money was. And as a result, we lost all the innovation that we saw in the late 80s, mid to late 80s and 90s of New game, new new setting, new everything. You know what I mean? It was really interesting. You would go pick up a game, and what's it about? It's about this, this, and this. Cool. What's this? What's the system like? And then you'd have to figure out what the system was. Some of them were duds with great attachments, and some of them were horrible settings with great engines. But uh, the D twenty revolution, I would say, is the dark cancerous legacy of Watsi. <laughs> Certainly spread metastasized like a cancer, right? <laughs> oh, oh boy, did it ever! Yeah, that's bringing back some bad memories there. The big eye slum out D20 book. That was that was a broken book. So let's uh, go ahead. I, I, this The panel is now opened up to all you guys. If you want to uh, uh, chime on any more of that before we go on to the next question. So please, uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns for each other with regard to statements that were made, or if you want to follow up more, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for you, Max. Or actually, uh -oh. I kind of want to talk about something you said. You were talking about how business ruins everything. But I think the shift between TSR and WotC isn't necessarily a business thing. I think it's due to a generational shift because most franchises, <laughs> most um, games and stuff, they, they, there's this phenomenon where things that are old, like you have the original founders who had, who, who studied the game design. They, they knew exactly the type of game they want to create and they created the type of game they wanted to create and then the second generation is the people that grew up playing that game that come in and attempt to or this is really the first generation they they attempt to recreate another edition of what they liked of the game but they don't they, they may have a pretty decent understanding of the original principles of it but they, they kind of come in and try to recreate a game and and they basically get it a lot of times but then the second generation that is growing up on the first generation game it, you end up with like a third generation translation of a first mm -hmm. generation game that misses the point entirely of the first generation game. And you see this through a lot of uh, franchises. You see it through Star Wars. You see it through all, all sorts of games like this. And I, I think it's more that. I think it's more the uh, poor translation through generations than it is um, necessarily business that ends up so, corrupting this stuff. So I, I have two, two responses to that. The yeah. first one is, is that... Uh, you, Heathen Dog and I have talked about this, and while we use the term addition in this case because this is what we were more talking about, almost exactly says what you said. The first edition of the game is the creator's intent. This is what he wanted to make. But even with a playtest group, you can only find so many bugs. So a second edition comes out and effectively perfects the game. That, that, for lack of a better term. And then either sells it off or other people oversplat it or whatever happens. Then you get the third edition that just takes away all what was special from the first and second edition uh, of the game. So that, that's one. The other side of it is, is the business side of it. When you market a game for masses, and this is what I feel that WotC did with Dungeons & Dragons, you ruin everything that's special about it. People don't want to deal with that because it's hard, so let's make, let's make life easier on them, number one. Um, well, you know, at your table, you allow dwarf wizards. At uh, Malachi's table, he allows uh, drow good guys. And at Bear's table, he allows what's something else that shouldn't be in the game? Psionics! That was never good in D&D. &D. Um, you know, but, but uh, you know, so instead of saying, we are going to keep these core rules within the spirit of what we had, where no, you cannot be a gnome paladin because the idea is stupid, we're going to flip the script on it and say, 
uh, no, everybody can be everything. Now game masters, because it's what I call backward think. Now game masters have to be like, no, 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 you can't do it because my world doesn't allow it and have to explain it. When it should be the other way around. It just ruins what is special or th what I call the spirit. For me, it's about spirit of law over letter of the law. And it really, like what WotC did was ruin the spirit of what it is. But by doing so, yes, marketed to masses, made a ton of money. It's the same thing that happened to World of Warcraft. I'll get to you in a second, Bear. Same thing happened to World of Warcraft, the worst MMORPG ever made because it ruined the hobby because everybody just wanted to copy it because of all of its dumb success by dumbing down the game. So and I'm not, by the way, people have heard this rant before, so I'm not yelling at yeah. you. It's just, you know. Oh, I understand. It's, <laughs> oh, it's funny like, because oh. I was on a... Go ahead. Uh, oh, no, no. Go there. ahead and go back, Adam, but I'm just going to invite everybody in the actually... chapter to open their prayer book of Max to the book of clown shoes, <laughs> uh, verses <laughs> 1 through 12, chapter 8. <laughs> I, I was actually on a debate show once where I was arguing that exact premise that you just argued, Max. But um, I, I, I do think, uh, over time I've come to think, because certainly TSR was marketing their game. In fact, they were, they were marketing it pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. I, I do think while... Uh, the watering down for marketing reasons is a major it, it is a major factor. I to me, the more I've kind of thought about this, I, I do think it has to do with poor translation through generations and failing to read the original source material and the, the generation I say they don't like it. I go I go one step further and say they didn't like the source, but they didn't like the limitations. We want you to use your imagination. Nobody ever took that away from people. It's just you had to now explain to the game master, or explain to me why are you trying to? Why do you want to play an orc that isn't a savage? Oh well, because of blah blah blah. You know what was it? Uh, Mistara, the um, what the Gaz Gaz the Gazetteers had. The, I forget the name of it, the orcs, orcs of whatever. Yeah, where you could play an orc, a hobgoblin, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what you had to do? You had to play with other orcs and other hobgoblins. So it lets you explore that premise, but you weren't some automatic good guy because it didn't make sense. Because it shouldn't make sense. It's a trope. Now, what Watsi did is Watsi said, no, you can do whatever you want, however you want, and have at it. Which is not a bad idea in premise, but when you put it in practice, it just allows, uh, to use, you know, Baird knows my term, it just allows clown shoes. Everything's a skin suit. I think you hit on something really interesting there, which is the imagination thing, the, the using your imagination thing, because it, it seems like WotC no longer really favors that as much because the new abilities and the uh, and the new player's handbook that they're releasing, which granted I've only read part of, but <laughs> in, the, in the brand new player's handbook that they're releasing, like the new abilities, they seem to be going in a direction now where they need all new abilities to be programmable because they're moving towards VTTs with programmable abilities, right? Which takes away from the core premise of the game, because I believe the TSR tagline, what was it? It was Games of Your Imagination, something like that. I, I might have Realm, that wrong. Realms of Your, uh, imagination. Realms of your imagination, yeah. Uh, which is just so counter to that now, because we're, we're not using our imaginations anymore. Everything has to be programmable. It has to be unique. You don't have anything like, all right, will you and the DM come to some conclusion as to what this divine intervention looks like or what this wish spell looks like, right? This stuff isn't, um, isn't added to the game anymore. Everything has to be numerical now. Mm -hmm. it, which I think is, I, I'm not going to say that's an innovation because it's like the opposite of that. What is the opposite of that? I, I know this word. Oh, well, anyway, <laughs> Somebody it, it's, it's like stream math. Once you're in a stream and you need to use, have something readily available, it's going to escape the brain. We're used to it here. So. Yeah, it happens to me like every time. Even yeah. in real life. So yeah. I, I, I love this part of the conversation because it can get me spun up and get more viewers. But I don't want I did say at the beginning, I wasn't going to we weren't going to have a I hate Watsy. <laughs> <laughs> meeting here uh, oh, but i think i do think you make some really you made some you know, really good points there and I, I think it's just how partially and how people want to look at it. see what they feel as this is more imaginative see the game lets me be more imaginative now instead of taking the initiative to be imaginative if that makes sense i truly hope you did not bring me on because you thought i was going to represent wasi here no 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 okay <laughs> no, no. okay I just everybody knows me and they know I, I hate the entirety of, of modern D and D. But I, I what I want is overall a good discussion on what the differences are instead of just I hate Watsi or I hate TSR. So you know, I think your points were very well made and, and very good for this commentary. But Bear, what is it that you wanted to bring up? 
In the time between the game creation of Gygax and the rise of the Wizards of the Coast, there was an age undreamed of, of pure imagination. Get No, I disagree. And I disagree based on the following thing. WotC does not sit at my table. They do not tell me how to run my game. They provide me a book that I can choose to ignore any part of it, just like I could choose to ignore any part of Gygax's Gygaxian prose. This idea that we have to be slavish to these games is the trap that we fall into and leads to these endless edition wars and this argument and that argument. We can supersede. We can accept, uh, escape. We can, we can get away from it all without having to be tied down by it. Now, if you have a preference, that's different. If you have a style that you prefer, that's different. If you have a flavor you prefer, that's different. But WotC, even if I'm playing 5e, doesn't run my table. I do. But that's the Gen X in you, Bear. There are modern people who are like, who are like, uh, you're not playing by the rules. It says here I can do it. This is why I call it backwards speak. Like when I uh, when I had that conversation, not with, but about um, this is years ago, uh, GNS theory, that channel. When he's like, I'm going to do all these things in my game and make you take them out. I'm like that's backwards speak. You're or backward logic. You're putting things in that are irrelevant, forcing me to take it out and either look like the bad guy or having to explain my position as a game master when the core game should be what's limited, and then we expand upon it at the table that that's that's like the main flip that i see with watsy versus tsr no and I, and I get what you're saying there and and ultimately at the end of the day i i am gen x enough that if someone shows up at my game and starts preaching to me how the game is run i'm going to politely point <laughs> to the door and say bye yep take care nice seeing you be good but beyond that i mean it, it's 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 we don't need to invest our souls into this. We don't need what? to invest our identities into this. We don't need to invest who we are into this. It's a it's a game. We should play the game and not worry about it beyond that. But again, I am Gen X. We are the DIY generation. What are you going to do? Fair enough. Okay, that was some good back and forth. There. Any any final alibis here before uh, I read some chat and then go on? Did I ask? I asked everybody the question, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Because I didn't write it down in my notes. Cause... Because that would have made sense. Okay, let's uh, let's hit some of the chat here. I saw some super chats come in. Then we're going to go on to segment two, video two, for the people who watch this later. Uh, if I can hit the right button. There we go. All right, where did we end off? We ended off... Okay, did we read that one? I said, somebody said love for the channel, so I'm going to put yeah. that on there again. But I think we read that yeah, one. We read the yeah. 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 <laughs> but, Hey, somebody said love the channel. I got to go with it, right? Uh, Someone said something nice about me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here we go. Law Dog for $10. Thank you very much. So true about making everyone the same. Everyone is basically a wizard now. Fi wi what? Fi wizards? Fi wizards? Oh, fi Fighter okay. Can, can cast uh, Action Surge. Pal Paladin Surge can cast Divine Smite. Rogue Surge can hide in plain sight. Invisibility, etc. Yes. Uh, hey! Get <laughs> bitch! Pardon me for the words, but my cat just snuck a treat when she wasn't supposed to. No. Whatever. You you're a thief. You go away now. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, I, like, I don't mind games that are set up like that. Like, people have already mocked me for Earth. Jeepers, creepers, calm down. Uh, have already uh, uh, mocked me for Earth Dawn, but Earth Dawn, the premise of the entire setting is the entire world is magically based. Dungeons and Dragons is basically Lord of the Rings in game form. It's not the same, and it shouldn't be treated the same. So, uh, yeah. Law Dog for five dollars also says. By the way, you guys are welcome to chime in in these comments as well. I know I kind of go through them quickly because I'd like to get the next segment. But if you got something to say on anybody's comments, go ahead. Everyone in D and D now is a superhero with magic superpowers. That's definitely true in Five E. There's a great game for that. It's called the game you want to play. It's called Heroic. <laughs> Law Dog, your check is in the mail. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Broadcasting Bears Heroic Game. I love that. All right. And, and, and I'm planning. I've been thinking about it a lot. And there is a fantasy hack of it coming at some point because I'm tired of these arguments. So I'm just going to give you the best fantasy game I can. In superhero form? No, in engine form. Okay. Using that engine. I know these next two aren't super chats, but they were definitely things I wanted to uh, point out. Third edition introduced the OGL, as was mentioned. And though that sucked in massive third-party support and slowly convinced other established companies to, uh, my God, to tie existing properties to D20. Yes, um, some of our favorite games all of a sudden became D20. One of, one of my favorite examples is uh, how many people have played Sovereign Stone? 
the game that was done by it. you have do you have the, but I have the original yeah see same here I wanted to actually talk to Larry Elmore about that, and then it converted to D20. A lot of games converted to D20. D20, and uh, all right, I'm going to say another rant. Uh, the D20 system is perfect for simplicity, but has no soul. I mean, saving throws, a broad staff wand, petrification, polymorph, a paralyzation, poison, death magic. Yeah, it might be a little, whoa, 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 okay, what's going on here? It has a system. You start at top, go to the bottom. Which one is it? Number one. Number two, it just, it has, has its own soul to it. Oh, just uh, do a wheel save. Oh, just do a fort save. Oh, just, that's boring. Is it simple game design to bring in the masses? Yes, 100%. Can't argue with that as much as I would want to. But it's also boring and uninspired. I like my games to have a little bit of a soul in it, even if the soul is flawed. I'm a ginger. I have no soul. I just get a freckle for everyone I steal. <laughs> Fair enough. I feel the tug every now and again. It's like, no, stop it. Oh, yeah, no, no. Your spot is right there. That's uh, that's reserved for you, buddy. No, that's where you forearmed me in the face. What are you talking? Oh, I get it now. That's how we take the soul. <laughs> All right, I, got, I got people in chat saying I'm not a real ginger. But oh, tell them <laughs> I'll show them my back at some point in time. They can connect the dot puzzles for oh, God. <laughs> TD says, in my opinion, third edition was very gamist, min-max version of D&D. Now, you have a lot of grognards actually say, well, that's kind of the way the original chainmail was as well. So that argument kind of works both for and against. Uh, not a jab. Play how you want. Just an observation and opinion. I, I, I agree in the terms of what I said before, like the Lego gaming. I hate Lego characters. In a class-based game, you play your trope. In a skill-based game, you, you make your Legos, if that makes sense. And I, I think trying to combine the two is... Yeah. Law Dog for another $5 says, where... In the, where in the quest for mass appeal do you lose the magic of the original creation? Watsy wasn't attentive enough to this pitfall. I Hopefully I said it enough for myself, but if you guys want to jump in where you think the magic was lost, if you even care, go ahead and, and respond to that, or I can move on. Players, options, uh, books, and oh, is where ah, the magic You was make lost. my brain. Fair. That's a very fair point. That's where the magic was lost. Yep. Sorry. Uh, I, I was out of D and D by the time those books came out, but when I went back and looked at them, I was like, "Ew, ew! Why would you do this? Ew, no!" You know. There's one you know. thing I took from the players' options: the bleed and injury effects. I like those. Any uh, harmony or Malachi? Anything you want to jump in on that? Um, the, no, where the, the, where the, the quest for powers. max appeal did, was the magic lost? Uh, what, what Bear said about two E when the skills of power stuff came out. It didn't need it. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that that's fairly self-evident. Like, I, I don't believe that you guys missed anything there, but yeah. Sounds good. All I think right. I said what I want to say on the topic. Go on. <laughs> all, all good. I just want to give you a chance. So again. <laughs> uh, let's see law dog for five let me put it on the screen here also uh everyone do a saw like and subscribe to legion of myth and all the panelists channels yes please everybody on this panel add something new and interesting to the hobby in some way shape or form or other and you should listen to what they have to say i mean of course me my ego says you should only listen to me but the reality is is there's believe it or not more people in the world than me and some no. even disagree with me and still survive don't know how that happens, but you should you should honestly uh, listen to what all these folks have to say. And five dollars again from Law Dog. Just a shout out to Max for repurposing the Streamlabs bot <laughs> to promote the research. Yeah, I fixed it a couple weeks ago. It's finally working now. So <laughs> apparently, I have to stay logged in or something weird like that. I just never used Streamyard, so there we go. Appreciate all the super chats that have popped in, but uh, I think it's time to move on to the next segment, which is going to be on game mechanics and system differences now we're going to dive in a little bit more into those mechanics although might we may have already answered some of those questions but oh, let me let me do this because i have to mark the end of the video Oop, there we go do you want to join if you think you have some charisma some presence the ability to entertain and educate a good av setup free from noise pollution and interest in discussing tabletop rpgs in this format join the some rando rpg live stream discord the link is in the description to stay tuned for future topics i am scheduled out for the end of the year there are spots open some are full whatever but if there's a topic you might be interested in go check out that discord and all the topics for the rest of the year are posted in the schedule tab but help us get to know you and 
maybe we'll get you on the show to talk about your experiences. And of course, if you enjoy this discussion, as Law Dog said earlier, please like this video and subscribe to all of the panelists' channels, which you can find in the description.